update to the second in the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network's educational teleconference series. And I'm Mary Beth Brangan, co-director of E.ON, the Ecological Options Network, and a founding member, along with Beyond Nuclear and Citizens for Health, of the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, FAN. And it's been a whirlwind week building up to this year's Becquerel Awareness Day, April 10th, BAD. <laughs> and um, on behalf of the FAN Coalition, I want to thank everyone who's been calling Senator Wyden and the White House to demand blocking of the fast track of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement and for signing our new petition. We have um, close to 800 signatures now, and we'd like many more. So please help spread the word about that petition, and Kim will uh, give you more information about that at the end. And welcome to all of you who are joining us on this call today, April 11th, 2015, um, focusing on stop fast track of TPP and saying no to radioactive food from Japan or from anywhere else, I might add. Uh, we'll hear today from James Turner, Cindy Folkers, Adam Wiseman, and then we'll open the discussion up to callers. And Kimberly Roberson, the Executive Director of FAN, will end our presentation today. So first, I'll give a brief overview of the current situation in Japan though I know that many of you on this call probably are very up-to-date. Um, and this look at the ongoing Fukushima catastrophe shows why our organization, E.ON, is working to close down our own potential Fukushimas here in the U.S. Uh, the new FAN petition features an extraordinary link to the new Fukushima Daiichi decommissioner who recently stated on NHK TV, the Japanese PBS, that the solution to dealing with the immense radioactivity from the three melted down reactor cores still needs to be invented. And he's hoping for international help and doesn't, uh, he's very unsure whether he's going to be able to make the current deadlines set by the Japanese um, government for decommissioning. There are parts of the nuclear plant that are emitting so much radiation that a few minutes exposure is lethal. Hundreds of tons of highly radioactive water pours daily into the Pacific Ocean and billions of becquerels of radioactivity goes into the air daily that continually contaminates the biosphere. And radioactive fallout from Fukushima has already contaminated a large part of Japan, including Tokyo. Both in the US and in Japan, though, there is official silence on the dangers to food supplies and also attempts to cover up. And Nancy Faust of Simply Info, the Fukushima Project, states in an April 7th, 2015 fan press release, quote, Taiwan recently found a rash of purposely mislabeled food imports from Japan. The items had different prefecture of origin labels than where the food was actually produced. And Taiwan and China currently have higher standards for food importation than the U.S. China has not only banned all food imported from the 10 Japanese prefectures they consider high risk, but they also require a radiation detection report and a government-issued place of origin for food certificate for items from other areas of Japan. Ms. Faust also says, quote, spot checks in Hong Kong also recently found contaminated green tea imported from Japan. Currently, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan 
all have better oversight of imported foods related to Fukushima contamination than the U.S. does. We'll hear from our first speaker, James Turner. Jim is the board chair of Citizens for Health, a national organization um, with thousands of members. A principal in the legal firm Swankin and Turner, he represents businesses as well as individuals and consumer groups in a wide variety of regulatory matters concerning food, drug, health, environmental and product safety matters. Mr. Turner has served as special counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Food, Nutrition and Health and to the Senate Government Operations Subcommittee on Government Research. Uh, he's been involved with many actions and suits against the FDA and I'm proud to say is a board member of E.ON. So Jim will discuss um, the FDA citizen petition status now uh, that we filed through SAM. Are you there, Jim? I'm here. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I want to uh, just um, underscore for a few minutes the, uh, the concept of the citizen petition that has been filed on behalf of fans. The, um, I say, and the idea uh, that um, is involved here is uh, basically facing in two directions. One is to put before the FDA, the agency responsible for writing food standards, uh, including the quality and safety standards, uh, the details of the situation as we know them to be uh, affecting the food supply from Fukushima. Uh, the, uh, the, the idea is to create a reservoir of knowledge that's available for anyone. The, the petition and its supporting documents can be um, accessed by anyone who wants to. Uh, we send people there who are interested in knowing more about the issue and to bring to the attention of the FDA the facts that are going on about uh, the, uh, the tragedy as it unfolds. Uh, for example, all of these regulatory uh, actions that are being taken uh, in China and Taiwan and so forth uh, can be filed as a part of this petition to the FDA. Um, it, uh, it, it is a way of creating a kind of a library, a kind of a, um, a uh, as I said, a reservoir of knowledge that people can draw on who are um, uh, at any point in developing an interest in this issue. The, um, the person who's uh, just the first time uh, hearing about it could be sent here to learn, uh, or people who are really, really involved in all of its uh, details can look at this uh, record and see how the issue is unfolding. But it has the extra advantage of creating an actual legal force. Uh, the FDA is required to answer uh, the petition uh, by law. Uh, it is a fact that FDA does not answer any of these petitions, uh, or they just answer them in a perfunctory manner. They say um, the, um, that they're supposed to tell us at six months and a year and they say, well, we're really, really busy with other things, so we haven't had a chance to get to your matter, but we will. But it does create an official formal record before the government that will require them to respond in some way. And that means a lot of uh, interests and activities that are going on by activist groups and sit other uh, concerned citizens that can be uh, filed in this petition actually become part of the unfolding decision-making. Some of these uh, petitions that are filed at FDA in this manner last for a long time, but eventually they see the light of day on the legal form and an event uh, can take place with uh, no possible legal action or uh, Congress taking any answers to the press. That's the, that's the facing toward the, um, the um, decision makers with this uh, petition. The other side of it is that it gives an opportunity for anybody in the public who is interested to file a comment with the FDA in support of the petition. Uh, the more of these comments that get filed, the more the uh, pressure is on the FDA to uh, recognize it as a serious issue. Um, and indeed, we did take some trips up to Capitol Hill and mentioned the existence of the petition, and uh, that was uh, one of the things that was we were able to get some attention, um, not necessarily activist attention, attention from uh, legislators, but at least uh, rhetorical attention. Tell us more, you know, call us on our phone and let us know what's happening. But 
the point on all these issues that exist, uh, on, of which this is a major one, and in some ways maybe uh, the most important in identifying uh, threats to the food supply, um, the important point here is that by and large, people do not know that they're going on. They are, they are left out of the media. They're not focused on by Congress. The, the regulators shy away from them. And the idea here is to create a place where there is a constant pressure on the regulatory process and on the decision-making process uh, that it keeps building like drop by drop. And uh, as the issue becomes more and more difficult to be handled um, by the people who are in power, the more they look for, and not only them, but the rest of society, looks for something to do about this issue. Um, presumably, if we do this petition process correctly, as we have been doing so long, so far, the ideas for how to address the problem itself will actually be codified in the petition at the FDA. And uh, the way I've seen these issues work over the last 45 or so years that I've been working on them in Washington, they'll be very quiet for a long time, and all of a sudden, Wayne Day, an issue will break out and something will have to be done. And uh, at that point, on this issue, uh, we intend for what's in the uh, regulatory file to become the basis of legal action, uh, uh, perhaps legislative action by Congress, certainly investigation, and also a reservoir of information for the media to look at. But what we're looking for from the petition side of things is to build up more and more knowledge in that petition record and to draw more and more attention to it from decision makers, um, the media, and the public in general. Uh, that's the, that's the, the petition strategy, which is a part of uh, a much larger strategy to deal with the, um, with the whole issue of Fukushima that they have been working with closely, and um, we're hoping uh, uh, and, and, and anxious and uh, happy to support. And Citizens for Health sends out periodic notices in this petition, and we will continue to keep doing that through our national membership. Um, and thank you, and I won't be able to stay on much longer, but um, uh, Mary Beth and Kim can both answer questions about petitions very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. appreciate the time that you spared for this today. Well, thank you for inviting me. From um, Cindy Fulkers. Uh, Cindy Fulkers uh, is the radiation and health specialist from uh, for Beyond Nuclear and has a master's degree in environmental science from John Hopkins and is a published author of articles on radiation, health, food, and children. And she'll be speaking of that, those exact uh, subjects <laughs> right now. Thanks, Cindy. Sure, Mary Beth. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm actually going to start my presentation with a quote, and it's an important quote because it lends insight into the actions we see happening on the national and international stage with regard to radioactively contaminated food. It's a quote from the ICRP. That stands for International Commission on Radiological Protection. They are the self-appointed international body that recommends how much radiation we can be exposed to. Their recommendations are used by governments all over the world to regulate nuclear industry radioactive releases. So this is the beginning of the quote. There may be situations where a sustainable agricultural economy is not possible without placing contaminated food on the market. As such foods will be subject to market forces, this will necessitate an effective communication strategy to overcome the negative reactions from consumers outside the contaminated areas, end quote. So here you have an international body from whom we should expect a modicum of independence, trying to inform governments that they will need to convince the public to eat man-made radiation in their food. What a huge conflict of interest to my mind, but it does explain in part the push internationally to not comprehensively test for radioactive contamination and to say eating some man-made radiation is okay. It is no surprise then that the ICRP is also the group that fails to fully account for radiation's impact, particularly in utero development sensitivities to radiation. So in reality, any exposure to radiation, while in beginning super sensitive life stages like embryonic and fetal can impact later life stages 
through adult onset diseases and aging. This is in addition to causing any childhood diseases. Therefore, radiation taken in by the pe pregnant adult female matters because what the mother eats, the fetus eats. And I'll speak on these risks more specifically a little later. Suffice it to say that FDA recently issued a recommendation that pregnant women eat more fish. This was at about the same time that the American Medical Association issued a statement supporting more testing of Pacific seafood in the wake of the ongoing Fukushima catastrophe, which Mary Beth talked about earlier on. This catastrophe, of course, is still releasing radioactive isotopes into the Pacific Ocean. Now, there is minimal testing being conducted by researchers at Woods Hole, which is a private institute, um, but these tests are for just one radionuclide, cesium, and just conducted on Pacific Ocean water. And since fish are not being tested in any robust fashion, bioaccumulation of radioisotopes in sea life is left nearly unaccounted for currently. There are other attempts at measuring as well, but they do also fall short, certainly in the amount of food that they test. A further critique of radio, radiation monitoring in food is comparing man-made to naturally occurring radiation. So I'm pretty sure that you've all probably heard the radioactive banana trope. Well, I want to settle that right now. There are two naturally occurring isotopes that are mentioned most in this context of comparison. So they are potassium-40 and polonium-210. Bananas, nuts, fish, to name a few foods, all contain minuscule traces of either or both of these elements. And Forest yet, wind. exposure to potassium-40 carries some risk, as does exposure to any radioactivity, man-made or natural. But this risk varies, as not all radiation is created equal. So potassium-40 has largely been discredited as a comparison isotope to radioactive cesium, first because potassium-40 exists in a balanced state in the human body. So you can never have much more or much less of it, no matter how much potassium-40 you actually ingest. It will always exist within a balanced range with some moving in and some moving out, right? So as the old moves out, the new potassium-40 moves in, and you won't ever get an increased dose from potassium-40 outside of this range. Radioactive cesium, however, can replace stable potassium since cesium is a potassium analog. So not only do you have the added radioactivity in your body, you also have cesium that is chemically different from potassium, even though it is a potassium analog. This is a problem chemically as well as radioactively. Polonium-210 the second one I mentioned is often found in seafood. It's what I call naturally occurring but artificially available. What do I mean by that? Well, there are studies that point to polonium-210's increased bioavailability in the environment, and this is due to man's interference through industrial processes, overfishing, burning of fossil fuels, uh, concentration and storage of certain mined minerals, harvesting of smaller fish, which is one result of overfishing. These practices all expose humans to increasing availability of polonium-210 through inhalation and ingestion. So at a certain point, because we've made this isotope artificially available, it has ceased to be completely natural anymore. Therefore, comparison to polonium-210 is also a fallacy. So I only bring up these two isotopes because the trope of comparing naturally occurring radionuclides in food is often used to minimize the damage of man-made contamination when, in truth, all of it possesses a degree of risk. And adding man-made contamination to the naturally occurring radiation increases that risk. So what kind of risk are we talking about? Well, let's examine particularly sensitive in utero development and childhood life stages. And I need to emphasize here, everyone must go through these stages. We all have to have a childhood to reach adulthood, so no one is immune. So let's talk about some numbers. These are dose numbers of radiation. So 4 millisieverts, or 400 millirem cumulative dose of radiation is enough to cause an increased risk of childhood leukemia according to recent studies on background radiation. Now, since actual natural background radiation is about 80 to 100 millirem per year, a child would reach this cumulative dose of 400 millirem, which is also 4 millisieverts, from natural radiation in about four years of life or so, and that includes nine or so months of in utero development. 
So we are already at a health deficit just from natural radiation exposure in our early life stages. Adding more radiation, man-made or natural, can only increase this deficit. In studies of children in Belarus, radioactive cesium inside the body started to cause heart problems at just 11 becquerels per kilogram of body weight. Becquerel is a measure of radioactive decay. At 50 becquerels of kilogram of incorporated cesium, tissue started to become permanently damaged. By comparison, the U.S. allowable limit of radioactive cesium is 1,200 becquerels per kilogram in food. Now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, was created in 2010 before the Fukushima catastrophe began, but in the context of the ongoing Fukushima catastrophe, one question is, where is the fail-safe of the TPP? What protects the U.S. public from the ever-changing circumstances of this catastrophe in this agreement? Well, nothing. In fact, things get worse for U.S. consumers. Currently, U.S. children can already be exposed to 12 times more cancer-causing man-made radiation in their food than children in Japan. This is because the U.S. non-binding limit of 1,200 is 12 times higher for radioactive cesium. So any food that exceeds Japan's limit, but not the U.S. limit, can be exported here. This is true currently, but as if this weren't bad enough, Under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it seems that the U.S. could be sued for rejecting this contaminated food and that U.S. taxpayers would have to compensate for perceived lost revenue from the rejection of this food. And if the U.S. were to attempt to lower its limit, as we are attempting to do through the citizen petition Jem mentioned to the FDA, it seems that the U.S. can also be sued for that too. So as an aside here, I should mention that through the FDA petition process, the coalition groups of FAN, of which Beyond Nuclear is one, have asked that this cesium limit of 1,200 be lowered significantly to 5 becquerels per kilogram and that food be tested for this isotope, cesium specifically. We chose cesium because it is easier to measure than other radionuclides, but it doesn't mean that other nuclides are of no concern. The fact is measuring radioactive isotopes is tricky, whether they're in food, air, or water, or soil, or anything. So the ICRP quote earlier that I mentioned, they say they mentioned market forces and an effective communication strategy to convince people to eat man-made radiation. But in conclusion, what I want to say is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership seems to remove even those slight obstacles, the pesky, pesky obstacles of market forces, and it removes the need for effective communication strategies. It goes straight to the realm of legal and monetary force. And when I first read the ICRP quote, I could think of nothing worse than tricking people into eating radiation while also tricking them into thinking it was safe. Boy, was I wrong, because the passage of the TPP will make matters so much worse. So that's my presentation. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Suzanne Davidson. Yes, hello. Um, I, I'm very much interested in, in the contamination of the food source as it stands now, and also it, it seems to be increasing as far as uh, the things that I've read, and what we know about that now, and also um, what kind of resources to look for on the web in terms of American food supply and the contamination from Fukushima. Mary Beth, do you want me to take that? I sure do. Okay. Um, Right. So I would have to, this is Cindy, I would have to know what sources you're looking at because there is a lot of information that's floating around out there. Um, And we have to put whatever measurements we do happen to get with food contamination, and believe me, they are few and far between in the United States, in the context of what contamination is already present, both from routine releases from nuclear facilities and also from above-ground bomb tests, So, and also other accidental releases. So those are, you know, three ways that our food are all potentially already contaminated to a level that we don't necessarily know or are not aware of. Um, so for measurement of foodstuffs in the U.S., We have very, very little data to go on, Uh, certainly not enough to get sort of a time course of what kinds of foods get contaminated when. And what I mean by that is as cesium or whatever isotopes you're, uh, you're concerned about 
are going through the environment. As they travel through the environment, they travel through sometimes at different rates. They get recirculated. Uh, they get taken up in trees, and the, the leaf litter can fall down. And, and so what you want to do with understanding radioactive contamination is you want to take it not just one time, but you want to take it over a continual time span. We don't have anything like that in the U.S. for any food source that I know of. Now, you know, there might be some secret testing going on, but don't quote me on that. It's nothing that I've seen. Um, so as far as operating in the public sphere in the U.S. for the U.S.-generated food supply, we do not have enough data to even begin to answer your question, unfortunately. Um, not to my liking. Now, in Japan, they have been doing more extensive food monitoring than in the U.S., but there is some question, and actually we're trying to work on getting the information, this monitoring information from Japan in a database that would be searchable, uh, and that's something that I'm working on with Nancy Faust of Simply Info, and we're trying to get that done. <laughs> so I'm in the process now of trying to deal with that, um, but in reality, there is some question as to how they are monitoring the food supply in Japan if they're looking at foods that would, A, be likely to collect the most contamination, and B, if they're looking at foods in contaminated areas, areas that we know are contaminated, versus foods from other areas that they know are going to be cleaner. And again, especially with the Fukushima deposition in Japan, you've got to look at a time course over years, because as you get the spring thaw, you get snow melt from the mountains, it can wash down and contaminate what was what was not contaminated previously. So this is a very, com very, very complex issue. Um, I mentioned there's, there's monitoring going on for seafood, but not much, not nearly, nearly enough, and it's just the water. One thing to know is that apparently they just took a measurement, Woods Hole did, off the coast of, I think it was the west coast, and it was 29 times higher, this is for cesium, um, than they expected it to be at this time after the accident began. So clearly their models are not being predictive of what was supposed to be happening at this time where we get a contamination reading that's 29 times higher. You're talking so, about the West Coast of America? Yes, I, yes, I believe so. So this, and again, it is, a, it is a small amount of radiation, right? It's a very small amount of radioactivity, but, you know, it's a water measurement. And so please understand that it is still, it is still considered small, but at the same time, it's 29 times higher than they predicted it would be at this time. So there is a real question here as to whether or not their models are going to be correct. Um, and it actually seemed to surprise the people at Woods Hole who took the measurement. So I don't know how to answer your question. There is no really good answer to your question about food monitoring. Um, it is something that we really need to push for. We really need to push for it. Um, well, I, I understand you know, that it's not being done at the moment. I understand that. But I, I can't imagine that it's not going to become a huge issue. So who do you think is going to do it? Well, what we would probably want to do, really what has to happen, in all honesty, is probably citizens have to do it at this point. I don't think that the federal government of the United States has the, either has the structure or the inclination or the, the training. They probably have, you know, some sort of training, but they don't have the inclination or the structure to plug into trying to measure this stuff. So even though they might know what they're doing with measuring food, I don't know that they're inclined to do so. So I really okay. think that it's probably going to be a citizen movement. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Cindy, could you please explain why you can't just use a Geiger counter, a citizen consumer model Geiger counter to um, measure food? Sure. So let's take the example of cesium-137 um, and strontium-90. Those are two what I call, or what a lot of people actually call, isotopes of concern that have come out of Fukushima and that would probably come out of any nuclear accident. And 
those two isotopes are both radioactive, but they're very different. One of them gives off a beta. Cesium-137 gives, uh, sorry, well, it gives off a beta and a gamma. So cesium-137 gives off a type of... Now I'm going to introduce Adam Wiseman. He's an organizer with the Global Justice for Animals and the Environment, an organization uh, addressing the threat posed by free trade agreements to animals and the environment, and safe, ethical, and sustainable food and the human rights of environmental defenders. Adam also represents global justice for animals and the environment in Trade Justice New York Metro, a coalition of organizations from diverse social justice and environmental movements who are working together to resist the um, NAFTA free trade model and um, um, TPP, I'm sure, that you can visit Global Justice uh, for Animals and the Environment's website um, at gjae.org and also tradejustice.net. Welcome, Adam. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you so much for taking up this important issue and recognizing how TPP threatens to make it that much worse. So I wanted to talk a bit about uh, some of the threats that TPP poses regarding food safety and particularly in relation to this issue, some of which have already been addressed, but just to go into a little more detail on that, and then also to talk about what the state of play is in fighting TPP. TPP is an agreement that is still being negotiated. We still have a very real chance to stop it. Um, if we take action right now, as many of you have already been doing by your tremendously valuable uh, efforts to put pressure on Senator Wyden. So thank you all for your work in that area. It is crucially important. So there are a few areas that we need to be concerned about uh, regarding TPP and food safety, and particularly uh, imported unsafe foods. One of them is how TPP will deal with food imports. Now, just something that I want to say prefacing this, something that we need to understand about the TPP process and how this, is, this agreement is being negotiated. Um, we need to first of all understand that much of what we know about TPP, um, we don't know. And what I mean by that is that TPP is being negotiated in secret. TPP in an unprecedented fashion and other uh, trade agreements being negotiated by the Obama administration are being negotiated under a complete veil of secrecy where the public is fully denied access to the negotiating text of these agreements in a way that has never been done in past trade negotiations. The Bush administration, as bad as its trade agreements were, were, was vastly more transparent in terms of letting the public know what was happening in trade negotiations. Well, the Obama administration learned from the dismal failure to pass a free trade area of the Americas, which, dem which generated hemisphere-wide resistance. So their strategy is to keep that information from the public in order to shut people out and not make people realize what a real threat this agreement uh, can potentially pose. And that is also true of the other agreements the Obama administration has uh, been attempting to negotiate. They've also tried to maintain the secrecy, and that has generated strong resistance um, in, the in the negotiating countries. So, for example, with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, there's now been, uh, there's now being for, uh, more openness is being pushed, whereas with TPP, we still have this, uh, this intense veil of secrecy. The, just recently, members of Congress were granted access to the TPP negotiating text. Until recently, even they had very strict and severe restrictions on their access. Congressman Alan Grayson, who was the first one to see any of these texts were reported that before this uh, most recent loosening, when he wanted to see the text of these agreements, he was required to go into a room, uh, closed door, couldn't make copies, couldn't take notes, couldn't bring staff, had someone from the office of the U.S. Trade Representative staring at him as he flipped through the pages of this document, trying to learn and remember what he could remember, and then was sworn to secrecy about everything he saw. So pretty much these negotiating texts are being classified as matters of national security, um, which is absurd because this is not a matter of national security. This is, uh, legisl this is legislation and economic policy and trade policy. This is not uh, military secrets. There's no reason these documents should be classified except for one, which is that the Obama administration wants to keep the public from realizing how much the public interest is being compromised in favor of the corporate interests 
who have the inside track to this agreement. And what does that mean? Well, 600 corporate, uh, there are 600 advisors to the negotiating process who are called cleared advisors. They are part of industry trade advisory committees. And these are committees that have special access to the TPP negotiating texts. They, uh, whereas our members of Congress have this highly restricted access that I've told you about and only now have slightly more access, and our, we, the public, have no access whatsoever, these members of negotiating committees can pull up the negotiating, sorry, the, of advisory committees can pull up the negotiating text at the click of a button on their computers uh, and read the, read the documents and uh, give their advice to the negotiators as to what they would like to see in these agreements. So who are these negotiators? Well, uh, the vast majority of them, over 500, are advisors from corporations uh, and industry groups uh, representing some of the, the many, some of the corporations that many of us would be most concerned about in terms of issues around the environment, issues around uh, human rights, issues around labor rights. Um, so these, are the, these corporations are the ones who have the inside track to this negotiation. The, uh, member, the public ha is locked out. Members of Congress have limited access. The media has no access. But the vast majority of the people who have this inside track access are the very corporate interests who we're fighting against in fighting this trade agreement. So, um, they, have, so they have that leg up on defining what's being negotiated. And, what we, and then once uh, the negotiation is complete, once the negotiation is complete, um, we, then the trade agreement, if the Obama administration gets its way, will be railroaded directly to Congress with uh, no real opportunity in between for careful, pub for careful public review. And the way that they'll do that is through the process uh, known as Fast Track. And the way Fast Track works, Fast Track is Nixon-era legislation that has been uh, repeatedly renewed. And uh, what it does is that Fast Track, uh, under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution contains the Commerce Clause that really puts Congress in the driver's seat of international commercial negotiations, of really of uh, defining our international trade policy, our, commercial, our international commercial policy. Uh, Fast Track delegates that authority to the, to the administration, to the executive branch, so that the administration can negotiate trade agreements. Uh, with con Congress can put guidelines on those negotiations, but it has, or we can suggest guidelines, but they're completely non-binding. The administration then sends uh, the fully negotiated trade agreements uh, to Congress in the form of implementing legislation. So Congress, in effect, puts them into law. And then Congress, in a way that is unique to any U.S. legislation, um, has a special expedited process for passing that legislation. So what does that mean? It means that Congress is required to vote on the legislation in 90 days, 60 in the House. And let's be clear, these are negotiating documents that are hundreds and hundreds of pages long, sometimes well over 1,000 pages long. And Congress, uh, with, their, with all the other bills they have to consider, has uh, two to two months in the House and three in the Senate to fully understand these impl the implications of these agreements that have been negotiated in secret. So civil society is locked out of actually being able to do analysis for the full length of ne the negotiation. Then everyone has to rush to study the documents and understand their implications, try to advise Congress, while Congress is, is while the corporate lobbyists go into overdrive, twisting arms, trying to push legislators to support these agreements. But the time limit is only one of the pieces that makes Fast Track so terrifying. Fast Track also uh, requires prevents Congress from holding up bills in committee. And they can't, this is a key piece. They cannot amend any piece of this legislation. They, are, they can't change a period. They can't change a comma. They can't change a single word because the negotiation is treated as a done deal. Any bill that goes to Congress, no matter what it is, Congress can amend that legislation. They can make changes if they, if they want to add riders, if they want to strike language, if something is badly written. They can make changes. Fast Track is designed to prevent that. And that's not all. Uh, fast Track is also actually designed to prevent debate on the legislation. Now, we have to Congress is to deliberate on legislation to have this body, this body that is supposed to carefully consider uh, our laws and have uh, vigorous debate, and then hopefully, not often the case, but hopefully come out with the best possible policy having heard all of the different arguments. Fast Track is designed to prevent that. Fast Track it requires each House to have only 20 hours of debate on the 
legislation. And what that means, you might think that means, well, okay, they can have two hours one day, six hours the next, three hours another day. No. It means that at tw the, once they start floor debate, the clock is ticking, and then at the end of 20 hours, debate is over. Uh, if they debate something else in the meantime, it doesn't matter. They have 20 hours from the start point. Congressman Alan Grayson has estimated that that means that in the House, each member, if every member of the House wanted to testify, they would have 88 seconds per member of Congress to testify. So really, you can see that Fast Track is designed to railroad trade agreements through Congress. It's been sold to Congress as a way to put Congress in charge. The way that President Obama is pushing this on Congress now is the idea that this is how Congress has its say on the negotiations. Because what the Obama administration did outrageously is it has negotiated three trade agreements as if it was already as if it already had the fast track. The president is not just supposed to go and negotiate trade agreements, but President Obama has been negotiating TPP for over five years and is now also negotiating the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the Trade and Services Agreement. So the Obama administration is marketing TPP uh, fast track as if, well, this is how Congress has it say, when just the opposite is true. The key thing that can happen right now with Fast Track um, is that Fast Track not happen. If Congress refuses to pass Fast Track, then what happens is these agreements will have to go to Congress under the regular order, meaning the normal procedures by which Congress considers legislation. Congress will be able to carefully deliberate over the text of, these, of this legislation. They will be able to make amendments as needed. They will be able to have as much debate as they want, and they can vote on it on their own timeline. And so some of the issues that I'm sorry, did someone? Okay. Some of the issues that uh, we need to make sure get addressed in order to prevent this trade agreement from being so disastrous in terms of food safety and particularly in terms of this issue, uh, a few key points. One is that trade agreements uh, like TPP um, actually affect our inspection process. We are in, it designed, it, uh, they're designed to allow it to encourage us to treat uh, the inspection processes of other countries in the agreement as equivalent to our own, even if their food inspection systems uh, violate key principles of our own food safety laws. So if we're already concerned that Japan is selectively testing, and we're already concerned uh, that uh, then we can, then think about the implication of Japan's food inspection system being treated as equivalent to our own, particularly if we are trying to push for more stringent rules in the U.S. than we already have. Uh, we heard before about this possibility for lawsuits, and I want to talk a little bit of, uh, more about how that process works because it really is worth understanding just how absurd this is. Uh, tra since NAFTA, trade agreements have been uh, have included language, many trade agreements have included. Um, an investor state uh, dispute settlement process. And what that means is that corporate investors are able to bring countries uh, to international tribunals outside the jurisdiction of their own national court system, uh, where those corporations can sue for unlimited sums in lost expected future profits, meaning that a corporation can claim that if an environmental, food safety, or other public interest law interferes with their expectation of future profits, uh, they can uh, they can name the theoretical sum of how much money they think they would have made into the infinite future and demand compensation for that amount. Uh, some of the cases where that's happening right now under current trade agreements, there's a case where Peru is being sued for over $800 million because they've required a smelting site that's classified as one of the 10 most toxic sites in the world to remediate, uh, to do uh, toxic remediation. The uh, U.S. investor has brought a suit for $800 million, not wanting to have to remediate the site. There's a case in El Salvador where El Salvador is being sued for over $300 million because El Salvador prevented a mining company from mining using uh, toxic chemicals near the largest, the river, the Rio Lempa, that provides 60% of the drinking water in the country. There, and that's the case under the Central America, U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement. And something that's important to understand about that case and why these rules are so dangerous, the company involved in that case is a company called Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim is primarily a Canadian company. Canada is not part of the U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement. So what did they do? They used a small subsidiary called Pacific Rim Cayman that was uh, based, I believe, in Nevada in order to claim to be a U.S. company so that they could gain access to these investor rights under the U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement. So what that means is that not only do we have to worry about 
uh, potentially suits being brought by Japanese companies. We can also have to worry about U.S. companies that may have an interest in importing food uh, using, let's say, a, an office in Japan to claim to be a Japanese company to gain greater rights than domestic corporations. The, uh, what, the investor state system is uh, absurd in that it is designed to – the argument for it is that it's supposed to prevent, uh, encourage corporate investment by allowing corporations to invest in countries where they may not have trust in the national court system as being fair, and they may be worried about uh, the government expropriating their resources. A, co a company doesn't want, uh, let's say, a country to uh, nationalize uh, its private resources. Um, they have they w the idea that they can have this international forum to bring these cases. Well, that, first of all, doesn't make sense when you're dealing with countries with highly developed court systems like many of the countries in TPP, including Japan. It also doesn't make sense when you look at just how ridiculous these tribunals are. They're tribunals of three unelected uh, trade lawyers who, with no conflict of interest clauses, these may be corporate lawyers in another week. They may have relationships to some of the very corporations in these cases. Uh, there is no appeals process in the, in the national courts of any of the countries for their rulings. It's not that they can necessarily overturn a nation's laws. It's not that the tribunal could strike down a U.S. law. What it could do is demand monetary compensation. And so for many countries, that has, an effect, that has a chilling effect on the passage of legislation that is challengeable under uh, these, uh, this tribunal system. So this could be used as an argument against passing more stringent legislation, saying that it would be in violation of our agreement under, uh, uh, under of our commitments uh, under the agreement um, and would be infringing on the rights of a corporate investor and could potentially bring uh, a suit of this nature. Um, we also need to look in particular at the issues around uh, seafood imports. Uh, the, one of the, there have been major concerns raised in relation to TPP around Malaysian and Vietnamese uh, seafood imports. As it is, the U.S. Uh, only inspects uh, less than 1% of imported seafood. And uh, with Malaysia and Vietnam, there are real concerns about uh, their, their shrimp imports uh, from, Viet, from Vietnam's uh, shrimp farms, which are where there have been high levels of uh, toxic pesticides found in shrimp. There are concerns about, with Malaysia, transshipment of Chinese shrimp. Um, in both cases, uh, with, with, well, in the case of TPP, we'd be looking at increased uh, seafood imports uh, from TPP member nations without a, uh, an increase in over, of, uh, of inspection capacity. So we would be uh, so the same, the, as it is, we're testing an absurd, we're looking at the safety of an absurdly small amount of seafood, but really are not putting anything like the kind of resource investment that would be required by this new import flood. And really, Japan hasn't been a part of that conversation, um, and uh, whereas, well, Malaysia and Vietnam have. Um, the also, uh, another thing that we need to look at in relation to TPP is food labeling. Um, we've already seen at the World Trade Organization several attacks on key food labels. One example is the, uh, the Dolphin Safe Tuna label, which, has been, which is, was for years subject to uh, challenges under first the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and later at the World Trade Organization. This is, as many, I'm sure many are familiar, the label that uh, gives consumers an idea of whether the tuna that they're buying uh, used methods, uh, that insert, methods of tuna catching that encircle dolphins uh, in order to catch schools of tuna that swim with dolphins. So the dolphin safe tuna label was challenged at the WTO. And keep in mind what we're talking about here. We're talking about not a, a ban on imports. We're talking about consumer labeling. Uh, also challenged at the WTO have been, uh, have been country of origin labeling on meat, meaning that uh, the WTO actually ruled that uh, countries do not have a right to put labels on meat packages that tell people what country those products were made in, um, because that would be discriminatory against, uh, against importers, and because people might favor, uh, might favor homegrown meat, they might favor meat from, uh, they might favor meat from, uh, from countries that they deem safe. So if consumers, uh, based on concerns about this issue, want to avoid uh, buying uh, Japanese products, that could potentially, uh, or, or specific products, uh, that they believe are irradiated based on uh, a feeling that Japan is inadequately expecting, inspecting, that could potentially uh, be challenged. And again, one thing that we need to consider, the difference between the WTO 
and TPP as the WTO countries can bring suits against other countries. Under TPP, corporations will be able to bring suits against countries. So if there's a particular corporate uh, interest that feels that their product is losing out uh, because of the, this, these labeling rules, that could potentially be challenged under TPP uh, by a corporate investor under TPP. So uh, what can we do about all this? Um, well, you've already been doing a great part of it with this important work around Senator Wyden. We know that uh, TPP, sorry, that Fast Track is expected to be introduced this coming week. We've heard reports that it will be introduced on the 13th or 14th. For uh, people who have, uh, just to give some background for people who are not familiar with why Senator Wyden is so key, he is the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee. And what that means is that he is the key Democrat on the key committee for Fast Track. Senator Orrin Hatch wants to introduce the Fast Track bill um, and wants it to be presented as a bipartisan bill in both houses. So he has been, so there's been wrangling between uh, Hatch and Wyden over what this Fast Track bill should look like. Wyden wants a few more safeguards in the bill. Fundamentally, he supports Fast Track. He is a big free trader. On the other hand, he tends to be an advocate of, trans of government transparency. So he wants some transparency language, which actually in many ways will make the bill worse. Um, the, the language that's supposed to be about transparency actually will have the opposite effect. Um, and so there's wrangling back and forth between them as to what exactly the bill should look like. The big question has been, uh, on the, uh, has been will Senator Wyden uh, cave ultimately in when he's feeling pressure to not support the bill at all? Because there's been inten an intense campaign against him. Uh, in Oregon, people have been following him around. They have a van. They, people have been doing, um, there have been blimps following him. There's, uh, there's uh, planes with, uh, with, uh, uh, with messages. Um, there are all kinds of different tactics that have been used. There have been protests. That, there have been occupations of his D.C. office, protests at his home in New York, in, uh, New York and D.C. And, sorry, he has a, in, in New York and Oregon. He has a house in New York. There is an, a disruption in a store, that, a bookstore in New York City that his wife owns. So he's been feeling this intense campaign from all directions. There's been threats to primary him uh, by unions if he comes out in support of Fast Track. So that pressure needs to continue until the last minute, until a bill is introduced, and we know that Senator Wyden is supporting it. He needs to keep feeling that pressure. Uh, we all need to be calling him, even if you're not Oregonians, you need to be calling him, but certainly if we know people in Oregon, they need to be calling him. We also need to be calling our own senators, particularly if they are members of the Senate Finance Committee, and letting them, and they're Democrats, and letting them know to put pressure on Senator Wyden to not support Fast Track, and let him know that it is not a matter of just you know, what the final language of the bill looks like. There is no acceptable Fast Track. There is no version of Fast Track that makes uh, for better legislation uh, than not having Fast Track. Uh, we also can contact our own elected officials uh, and let them know, and try to get commitments out of them to not support Fast Track. If it seems like Fast Track doesn't have the votes to pass, it won't move. What we're trying to do in both houses is a stalling process because as we get later and later in the year, um, it becomes more politically costly. Hillary Clinton is already starting to feel political pressure around the agreement with Europe, uh, even before she's announcing her presidential campaign. So this is a very this could be very politically toxic, which is why there's a lot of pressure to move it now. Uh, free trade agreements are wildly unpopular. People know that NAFTA was a job killer for the United States. So while people think international trade is a good thing, they do not think these kind of trade deals are a good thing, and of course they're right. So the, the more we can stall the process, the harder it's going to be politically to move this. The other effect of stalling the process is that it is, helping, it is really helping the TPP negotiations break down. TPP was really moving well at the beginning of the year when President Obama promised that with a new Republican Congress, he would have no trouble getting fast track through as he did with the Democratic Congress, which is a very interesting statement on the part of our president that he is so delighted that his own party lost and that now he can collaborate with the Republicans um, in undermining the values of his own party. But in any case, uh, so now that fast track has stalled because of the pressure of people like us, um, the negotiators are being much more reluctant to make concessions to the U.S. negotiating team. There are still many contentious issues in the ongoing TPP negotiations, and other negotiators from other countries are not necessarily willing to make uh, concessions that could be politically costly at home if they are not convinced that the U.S. will actually be able in the end to deliver on TPP. And the concern is that without fast track, Congress might actually do its job. 
Congress might deliberate on this agreement. They might study it and understand it and uh, make, and make am amendments to the language and uh, potentially not even pass it at all. And so the foreign negotiators do not want Congress to do its job. They want that power to be in the hands of President Obama so that once the negotiation is uh, done, it's a done deal, and then Congress will send the, then Obama will send the uh, agreement to Congress. And uh, as has happened with every trade agreement in history that's been negotiated under fast track, um, that agreement will ultimately pass. So by slowing fast track, we are not only increasing our chances of stopping TPP in Congress, we are actually slowing down the entire tr uh, negotiating process for TPP. And what may potentially happen if we're successful is what happened with the FTA, the Free Trade Area of the Americas, in the early 2000s, which uh, never reached Congress. And the reason it never reached Congress was there was so much external pressure that the entire negotiation broke down. So FTA just kind of fizzled. It quietly went away one day, never to be seen again. And if we do our job right, that is what can happen with TPP. So we need to uh, keep the pressure on up. Uh, so we need to keep up the pressure on our legislators. As I said, Senate Finance Committee members are key. Also key is our members of the House. The real battle in stopping fast track in the end is going to be in the House. Um, if Senator Wyden comes out in support of fast track, uh, we are pretty convinced that fast track will pass the Senate. Um, if he doesn't, um, it's going to be a bigger battle. But still, uh, the, the, the numbers game in the Senate is not good for our side in terms of stopping fast track. The House is, is very much a different story. And the reason for that is because uh, in the House, we not only have Democrats on our side, we also have about 50 Republicans on our side. There are Republicans who do not think that uh, ceding massive power to President Obama is a very good idea, that putting President Obama in charge of our international trade negotiations is something that we want to be doing. These are Republicans, many of whom were elected on uh, campaigns around executive overreach and taking power back from President Obama, who is this imperial president who wants more and more power. It does not look very good for, to the, for their base voters for them to be voting on this legislation that cedes massive power to President Obama. And we should remember that these trade agreements are not really just trade agreements. They have increasingly become a way to tuck domestic legislation um, into, trade deal, into trade agreements. TPP has 29 chapters, only five of which are actually about trade. The rest of the chapters are about all kinds of domestic policy issues that presumably re Republicans in Congress would not want to give President Obama exclusive authority over. Things like regulating Internet use. Um, things like uh, intellectual property rules relating to medicines. So these are reasons why both Democrats and Republicans feel that this uh, feeding of power to the president uh, is a very bad idea. There are also concerns on the right about how these tribunals will affect U.S. sovereignty. There are also concerns about the issue I mentioned before about uh, the, the Constitution putting Congress in charge, and there are fears that uh, supporting TPP undermines constitutional separations of powers. So for conservatives who identify as strong constitutional conservatives, that's an issue of principle to uh, respect the spirit of the Constitution, especially when it means giving more power to a president they hate. So in the Senate, in the House, we have, it looks like well over uh, 200 uh, uh, members of the House who are against fast track. And it really is going to come down to the last few votes to decide who is against this agreement. And um, with the Central America Free Trade Agreement in 2005, we lost by one vote. That is how these trade agreements also often, trade negotiations often go. The last fast track uh, was a very close vote. So we are really now involved in kind of uh, intensive warfare for every last vote. Uh, we, cannot let any, we cannot let any member slip away. Every member of Congress, Republican or Democrat, needs to be feeling intense pressure from their constituents to uh, come out against fast track. And, and it's not enough for them to say, well, I'm considering it, and you know, I'll, I'll let you know in the future. No, they need to come out against fast track now. Some of them are saying, I'm waiting for a bill. Well, there may be a bill next week, so they will no longer have that excuse. But even if they don't use that excuse, we can say back to them, Senator Orrin Hatch has said that this fast-track bill will be almost identical to the fast-track bill from last year, the Bipartisan Trade Priorities Act of 2014, which was so unpopular that despite being called a bipartisan bill, it could not find a single sponsor in the House. Even the most pro-free trade members of the House 
uh, stringent, uh, sorry, strong uh, free trade supporters like Congressman Gregory Meeks of Queens, New York, would not sponsor this bill. And so this is basically the same bill rehashed with a new name and new sponsors when, and some minor tweaks. Um, and this is the message we need to send to our elected officials. Uh, Paul Ryan, the new chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, is trying to use this uh, language about how this puts Congress in charge and we need to do this to give Congress a say, really parroting the language of the Obama administration. Um, and so we need to push our, uh, we need to point out to our Republican members, Paul Ryan is sounding an awful lot like Barack Obama. Doesn't that bother you a little bit? Um, we cannot let them get away with that excuse. There is no member of Congress who should be allowed to vote for fast track. On the 18th of this month, there is going to be an International Day of Action uh, to uh, to against trade agreements like these, against these destructive mega trade agreements that are about more than trade. And we will be uh, encouraging groups all over the country to participate in this Day of Action and also on actions, uh, on actions before and after uh, that action. That's a weekend action, so it's not necessarily the best time to protest members of Congress. Um, but certainly in the days before and after, we need to be getting out there as well as participating in that day of action. Um, people can find out more about this upcoming day of action and some of the other immediate actions coming up. Tomorrow night, there's going to be a national uh, conference call and webinar that is going to feature Senator Bernie Sanders speaking about the threat of TTP and what we need to do to stop it, as well as Arthur Stimulus, who is the Director of Citizens Trade Campaign, which is a national coalition of unions, environmental groups, faith organizations, human rights groups, and other organizations, farm groups, all united in the fight against these destructive trade deals. You can get the details about that event, that webinar, and by going to our website. If you go to tradejustice.net and click on Upcoming Events, you'll see, just click on Tomorrow's Date, and you'll see the details on how you register for that event. We have webinars every Sunday. There are also national conference calls every Wednesday. So there are lots of opportunities to plug in and find out more. Every Tuesday night, there are national uh, TPP or international TPP Twitter storms where you can take to Twitter and try to get hashtags trending to get the word out about stopping TPP and stopping fast track. You can find details on those as well. All of those events in the upcoming events tab of our website, tradejustice.net, and just click Upcoming Events in the left column and you'll see all of that information there. If you're not sure who represents you in Congress and you want to find out, you can go to tradejustice.net forward slash LEG. And uh, if you want a very easy way to make a call to your elected official to let them know that you oppose Fast Track, you can go to stopfasttrack.com and then enter your address and you'll be connected. They'll, you'll get a call that will connect you to your elected official. So there are lots of easy ways to plug in. Uh, for many of us, we may want to engage at levels beyond that, but if we want easy ways to plug people in, those are ways to do it. You can also, at our website, uh, find lots of printable publications that, will, that, you can, that you can, you're welcome to print and distribute. None of our materials are copyrighted. You are absolutely welcome to share them with uh, anyone you like. And uh, if you want to put local contact info on them or anything like that, that's fine. You can contact us directly if you want to make changes to any of the documents. Um, I'm going to give my contact information so people can get in touch with me if you have any questions after the call, though of course I'm happy to stay on and take questions on the line. Um, so my information, you can contact me at 718-218-4523 um, or email me at adam at tradejustice.net. Our organization, Trade Justice New York Metro, is a coalition of groups in the New York metropolitan area. But we work closely with advocates really um, around the country as well as with allies in other countries. So chances are we can connect you with advocates in your community who are already working on this issue. And if there aren't people already working on the issue in your area, we can tell you how to find some of the likely groups that will be working on these issues. Uh, also, I, you can, our other website, which was mentioned before, gjae.org, that is Global Justice for Animals and the Environment, and okay. is a great place to find out more about some of the environmental aspects of these agreements. Um, 
Thank you. So radiation called beta and a type of radiation called gamma. Gamma is much more penetrating. It's easier to measure. Therefore, what they try to do is they try to focus on the cesium isotope, and they try to measure that in the food. The strontium-90 isotope, on the other hand, gives off a fairly what they call soft energy beta, which is much, much, much harder to measure, particularly in food. So you would have to pulp the food or ash the food. And so so you might be able to get a reading in your food using a Geiger counter if it's got a high enough level of cesium contamination. Cesium is going to be difficult to measure with a handheld if it's below a certain level, but the level could still be more than you would probably want to eat. Yes, so oh, I've, I've done some reading about that, and I understand the difficulty there. Okay. Okay, That's why good. I was hoping Thank that you. there would be some organization that would do it, you know. I'd like to introduce Kimberly uh, Roberson, uh, who she's worked extensively on environmental activism at St. Fries, the Nuclear Democracy Network, CalPER Greenpeace, and then as a certified nutrition educator at recovery programs in the Bay Area. She served on the board of National Association of Nutrition Professionals and as a founding officer for the California chapter. Kim has lobbied for health and environment on the state and federal level and wrote the first petition calling for radiation monitoring of food in 2011, which led to the formation of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. She's authored Silence Deafening, Fukushima Fallout, A Mother's Response, and is co-creator of the Radiation Awareness and Protection Talk program. She consults at New Health Design. So please take it away, Kim. Hi, Mary Beth. Thank you so much, everyone. I really want to give a special thanks to our presenters and guests for taking up your precious weekend time today to be with us. And I hope you go away from this feeling informed, and I'll have some actions going forward to help empower us. Adam, Cindy, Mary Beth, and Jim all did wonderful presentations. And I wanted to just give a little bit of background info to people who may not know very much about FAN, because I think we have newcomers here. FAN is the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. And just I'll try to be as brief as possible. FAN's mission over the past four years has always been the same. And we remain a coalition of groups and concerned citizens who share information and resources in response to the ongoing radioactive fallout at Fukushima and then act to find solutions. Now, we're committed to holding U.S. agencies and elected officials responsible for protecting the food supply, and we also network with people in Japan as well. In fact, a few women who came from Japan after the disaster started were very much a part of helping us write our citizen petition, one woman in particular, and we couldn't have done it without them because they came here and said, wait a minute, we're leaving a country contaminated with radiation to come to the United States, which, which allows 12 times the amount of radiation. So that really helped to focus us in our work when we filed our citizen petition in March of 2013. Now, our current campaign supports the FDA petition. We would like to branch out more into citizen monitoring, which just came up a few moments ago. We do have resources on our website. We will be building up more around that. There's a great group called Fukushima Response with John Bertucci and Gina Brooks that have been doing a lot of work on um, citizen monitoring of food. So we'd like to put people in touch with them as well. And our current um, citizen petition, as Cindy and Jim were saying, lowers or seeks to lower the current allowable levels of radiation in the U.S. food supply. It's currently the highest in the world. And it's only a recommendation at that, which is like having no binding level at all. It's like having really no protection at all. So you know, we just finished up a week of actions culminating with today's event, but we still have much more to do. We had two press releases in this past week. We created a new petition, um, which is at our website, uh, www.ffan.us. That's for Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, .us. And I wanted to tell you all that several of us in FAN, um, a few years back, maybe even longer, three years or so, have met several times with aides of senators here in California and in Washington, D.C. We met with Barbara Boxer's aides. 
with Dianne Feinstein's aides. And in fact, once there was an unexpected face-to-face meeting with Senator Feinstein. I wasn't a part of that because I'd been on the phone here in California when Mary Beth and Cindy and others were in her office in D.C. meeting with an aide. When they came out of the office, they ran into her and told her face-to-face, you know, look, we know, we have proof that radionuclides have fallen on the soil in California. We had this through University of Berkeley School of Nuclear Engineers. They were keeping, keeping extensive data on their website. Now that data seems to have been kind of shoved further into the website, and there's a breezy video kind of explaining that there's really not much to worry about. The testing's still happening, but they're not finding much. Well, you know, we know better, and, you know, that's what FAN is all about, trying to keep this information out in the, in the public to the best of our ability and continuing with our food uh, petition to FDA. And I wanted to mention that it just came to my attention yesterday. Now, Adam had talked briefly about um, the seafood from, uh, I believe it was Vietnam and Malaysia, that's catching the attention of some Democrats. They're concerned right now with TPP and what this means. And one of their names is Rosa Delorio, and she's a third district uh, senator in Connecticut. She's a Democrat. And she released a statement just two days ago um, telling the Obama administration and Congress that she is very concerned about what would happen with the already backlogged and overtaxed Food and Drug Administration with TPP when we are already struggling to keep seafood as safe as possible. And she did not mention Japan, as, as Adam had said. Japan hasn't come up on their radar yet. We're not exactly sure why, but we're going to do everything we can to change that. So, you know, we had our two press releases earlier in the week. I don't know if it caught the attention of someone there or not. But our new petition, we we are continuing to accept signatures. And we do have a uh, hopefully a meeting coming up this week with aides in Senator DeLauro's office just to let her know what we're doing and to give her as much information as possible to help her. Um, in blocking fast track. I'm not sure exactly where she is in the general fast track uh, situation, but we do know that Bernie Saunders and Sherrod Brown and Elizabeth Warren are all very vocal and outspoken about TPP. So anything we can be doing to share our petition and press release on their Facebook pages and calling their offices in addition to Senator Wyden's office would be a good idea. So all of this information is at our website. I want to tell you one more time. It's www.ffan.us. You'll find our press releases, all of our petitions. Not only do we have the FDA petition, our new block fast track of TPP petition, we have a move on petition that went up two years ago. We call it the Bye Bye Becquerel's petition. And then there's the first change.org petition that went up on April 1st of 2011 to monitor our food supply. So for radiation. So to finish up, I, well, I did hear back. I wanted to tell you that we did hear back from one of the aides in Stoloro's office who said that she extended her apology. She was not able to join our call today, but that she is interested in the work that we're doing. So I feel optimistic that we still have a way to get our, our specific message across to Congress because we've been trying a long time. <laughs> so I wanted to end by asking for your support. We have a donate button on our website, and anything helps. Um, someone said once we operate on a bake sale budget. We don't even have bake sales right now. So <laughs> anything that anybody can give, no matter how small, it, we really appreciate it. And we also need people to donate their time and energy as well. So um, thanks again for being on the call. And Mary Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I just wanted to say that... Um, in the, uh, we'll have the information about um, getting copies of the recording both on YouTube or just to call in and listen on the phone. Uh, we'll post that uh, on the fan site as well as the Facebook page and the Eon uh, Facebook page and the Eon site and Beyond Nuclear <laughs> as well. So uh, I hope that, I mean, I think everybody spoke so quickly, and if we had more time, I wanted to to discuss more with um, Cindy myself. But I think um, it, our time is up, and I, we thank you so much for joining us today. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.